Back before the days of smartphones and SD cards, we all used to shoot our photos on film. In my family, this task was accomplished by my mom using an Olympus Infinity Stylus, also known as an Olympus Mu overseas. At the time, this was just another easy to use camera that you could buy at Walmart. Today, however, it is a highly sought after camera for whatever reason. I received this camera as a hand-me-down whenever I decided to start experimenting with film during my college years. And although it did serve me well for a while, it eventually broke. But today, we're going to use 3D scanning to fix it. Inside of this camera, there is a small plastic piece that is used to interface with the roll of film. Once inserted into the film, this plastic piece is used to advance the film between photos and also to rewind the film once the film is used up. Unfortunately, over the years, this plastic piece became brittle and eventually one of the tiny plastic fins on the side broke off. Once this happened, the small plastic piece just fell out. So, in order to fix this part, we're going to follow a process known as reverse engineering. Needless to say, the first thing we're going to do is 3D scan this part. But first, we need to decide what lens set we're going to use. This part is very small, measuring less than 10 millimeters in total height. Because of this, we'll need to use our largest set of lenses. This set of lenses is used to measure a field of view 45 millimeters across. Paired with our Steinbickler Comet L3D 5M scanner, I'm confident we'll be able to see the details that we need for this project. After booting up our PC and turning on our 3D scanner, we can turn our attention to calibration. Because we changed the lens set on our 3D scanner, we'll need to recalibrate the scanner to make sure it is measuring accurately. I'm sure at some point I'll make a more detailed video on calibrating the Steinbickler Comet 3D scanner, but for now all you need to know is that you place a calibration panel on a table, you point the scanner at it, and then the software will guide you through a series of nine measurements. In between each of the measurements, the software will prompt you to manually move and reorient the calibration panel to nine different locations. Once that's done, we get our calibration report, everything looks good, and hey, while we're at it, why not check the temperature to make sure we're sitting at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Because the ideal surface for 3D scanning is matte white, we will need to coat this part in titanium dioxide powder. Before coating my part, I always like to clean my part with denatured alcohol to ensure that the coating will stick to the entire part and also to make sure that there's no debris on the part that will cause inaccurate measurements. This part is really small, so instead of using a normal fixturing kit or designing a custom fixture, I'm just going to press this part into a small amount of sticky tack. And again, because this part is so small, I can't put any reference point stickers on the part itself. So instead, I'll put a high quantity of reference point stickers surrounding the part. This will allow the software to align each scan to each other by aligning the reference point stickers seen in each scan. As I mentioned earlier, we will need to coat this part in order to get the best scans possible. I accomplished this using an airbrush and a small paint booth. After coating the part, I like to clean off any excess titanium dioxide powder that might have gotten onto the reference point stickers, and this will just make it easier for the software to detect those reference point stickers. Now it's time to start the 3D scanning process, and this is the process where we start to begin measuring data on the part, and we can really start to see our measured data come together as a 3D model in the form of a mesh. After creating my project, I can select the number of rotations that I would like to use. Because this part has some detailed geometry down at the bottom of a hole, I'm going to use a lot of rotations for this first set of scans. Next, the software prompts me to enter the measurement settings. I'll first position the 3D scanner over the part so that I can make sure that I'm setting my exposure times correctly. Now we can adjust the 3D scanner's exposure. The exposure can be set by dragging the sliders in the settings window. When measuring with reference point stickers in your images, it can sometimes be advantageous to take the scan using two different exposure times, one for the part itself and one for the reference point stickers. The goal is to increase the exposure time as high as you can without also blowing out the image. 
areas of the image that are too bright will not contain any measured data. Once my settings are in place, I can do a test scan to make sure that they will work. If everything looks good, I can proceed to taking scans at all of the remaining rotations. Zooming in on this test data, I can look and see that it is measuring all of the features I hoped that it would. Because of this, I will proceed to measuring scans at all of the additional locations. But first, the software prompts me to sketch a plane. Everything underneath this plane will get removed from the final data set. Now we can sit back and watch the data flow in. Once all of the scans have been measured at all of the specified locations, we can see the finished result in the 3D view. As you can see, there's still a lot of missing data, so we'll need to reorient the scanner and take scans at more rotations in order to get the data that we need. After manually adjusting the position and orientation of the scanner, I can return to the software, and after setting up my new set of rotations and checking the settings, I can proceed to measuring additional scans. After completing the second set of rotations, there is still more data needed, so I'll move on to measuring a third set of rotations. It now looks like we have enough data measured on this side of the part. So next, we will clean up the part, flip it over, coat it again with titanium dioxide powder, and follow the same procedure to measure the back side of the part. Since there are fewer features on this side of the part, the process goes much faster. Once we are satisfied with the amount of data that we have, we can align both sides of the part together. Since we don't have any reference point stickers on the part itself, we will use the geometry of the part itself to align it. You will notice that there's a lot of data measured on the sticky tack, so the next step in the process will be to select that data and to delete it. Next we will perform a global registration on all of the scans. This process will ensure that every single scan is aligned well to each other. Finally, once we have a good clean set of data, we can create a mesh from the point cloud. The next step I will take is to import the mesh into Goman Spec so that I can create a coordinate system on the mesh. This coordinate system will come in handy when it's time to rebuild the CAD model for this part. But before we get into that, let's first admire the mesh that we have. It's really amazing that Structured Light 3D Scanning is able to take such a tiny part and create such an accurate mesh from it. Features that were barely visible to my naked eye prior to scanning this part are now very easy to see, including that broken off fin. While inspecting the part, I did notice some bad data that was floating in space. 
before moving forward, I'll go ahead and delete that now. Now I'll add the coordinate system to my part. When creating a coordinate system for your mesh, it's a good idea to use mating surfaces. In the case of this part, the external surfaces seem to make the most contact with the camera when this part was slid in, so I'll be focusing on these exterior planes. With these four planes constructed, I can now construct mid planes from them which will constrain the part in the x and y directions, but I will still need one plane facing the other direction to constrain the last degree of freedom. Now that I have three nearly perpendicular planes defined, I can use them to create a coordinate system. Once the coordinate system is created, I can rotate the part using this cube in the corner of the 3D view. It should be obvious if the part is not aligned well, because the part would be skewed at each of these locations. In our case, the part is aligning very nicely to each of these predefined views, so this coordinate system should work well. The last step we will take in this software is to reduce the mesh size prior to exporting the mesh. This will allow the CAD application that this mesh is imported into to remain responsive throughout the reverse engineering process. If there are too many triangles, it will really bog your system down. Thankfully, GOMINSPECT has a function that allows you to reduce the mesh while also maintaining a specified level of accuracy. It even allows you to see the deviations of the mesh before and after its size is reduced. This will ensure that our mesh is still accurate, despite its new reduced size. We will now export our newly aligned and reduced mesh so that it can be imported into the CAD application of our choice. The CAD application I will be using today is FreeCAD primarily so that I can show that anybody can follow the reverse engineering process if they have measured data. This application is completely free, and although it is a little bit painful to use at times, it does get the job done. After importing my mesh, I can start sizing up this part. I'm not going to go into too much detail into the CAD building process, but essentially we're looking to add material and remove material in order to get a CAD model that closely matches our measured data. If you're using a dedicated reverse engineering application like Geomagic Design X, there are a lot of tools that help you out with this process and make it much faster. However, today, I will just be creating geometry visually using this mesh. This process is primarily a trial and error process. I may get halfway through the reverse engineering process and realize that the original designer of this part might have designed it differently and I'll have to restart, but that's all part of the fun. I'll speed this part up so that you can see the progress more quickly. Once I feel like I have a reasonably accurate CAD model, I will import it back into GOMA Inspect to perform a surface comparison. This will allow me to see how accurate my CAD model really is compared to the original data that I scanned. 
If I notice any high or low spots, I can return to the application and make adjustments. When I'm finally satisfied with the accuracy of my model, I can export it and send it off for 3D printing. After receiving the 3D printed parts in the mail, we can test them out to see how they work. To be completely honest, this is the second version of the part. The first version of the part that I sent out proved to be too brittle and it broke off when inserted into the camera. After beefing up the fins a little bit, I'm confident that this new version of the part should work nicely. Now for the moment of truth. I first assemble the spring to the new part that we printed. Next, I insert it into the camera and we will see if it works. After much finagling, the part finally clicks into place and it appears to be working. The only step left to do is to load in a roll of film and see if it works. As you can now hear, the film is now advancing and everything is working as expected. Not every reverse engineering project goes this well, but I think that we can call this one a success. If you are interested in collaborating in a project, our email address is listed in the description below. Thanks for watching.